I am a heart survivor and an MS warrior. I am thankful that you are allowing me to share my story with you. I was born with a congenital heart disease and aortic defect. And although I've had many trials and triumphs, I know that life is a gift and that is how I am using mine. I hope from my story, you learn that even in your darkest hour, you can use your light to shine. I am Teresa Wright Johnson. I ain't that shit. It's about self-empowerment. It's about self-awareness. It's about self-respect. My name is Rayshawn Tate, and welcome back to another fantastic episode of I Ain't That Chick. And you know, as I always say, I'm a firm believer that every woman has a story and women empower women when we share our stories. So with that being said, I do have another fantastic guest with me today. Please say hello to our audience. Hi, everyone. You guys, you've met Teresa, you've heard her intro, and we are talking about some serious subject matter. So please, please, please ask some one to tune in. So yes. Teresa, you talked about heart disease in yes. your intro. And you know, the first thing I thought, and, and, and not to downplay the seriousness of your message, but heart disease, you know, when your heart is broken and you have those challenges, that's kind of where Nate was kind of going with that. Right. But you had heart disease at a young, at a young age? Absolutely. How old were you? Take me back into your childhood. Okay, from what I understand, when I was born, I was born with a heart murmur, mm -hmm. which, you know, was a lot, it was common, um, but with a heart murmur, you have to be monitored by a cardiologist, so I was monitored by a cardiologist from birth, and around one, my first year of life, um, my parents took me back to the doctor, and they realized that I had a congenital heart defect, which was an aortic valve defect. Okay, wait, let me, because the, like the doctor has told me, and you, you, my eyes just perked up when you said that, because the doctor has told me to tell you have a slight heart murmur. Right. And I just ignore it. And I think a lot of people probably just ignore it. Right. But now, were you experiencing any type of symptoms? No, I, oh. I was not. Well, and remember, I was an infant, right. and, you know, so a lot of this stuff is from my parents, right. their account. But what happened is um, when they heard it, you know, in, in addition to the heart murmur, they kind of knew that there was something else going on. They just didn't know what. Mm -hmm. So they knew I had the heart murmur, but they knew that it was something else. And that's why they had to, I think, watch me even closer. Okay. Because remember, heart disease today and heart disease back 40 something years ago had a different, different look. Yeah. We didn't have as much technology mm -hmm. as we have today. You know, it was a lot of conditions were a lot harder to diagnose. And I think that's what my parents came up across. But my mom did tell me that from day one when they listened to me, they said her heart is not normal. She has a heart murmur and there's something else we have to figure out what it is. Yes. Okay. How long did it take them before they figured out what else was there? Uh, one. When I turned one. You turned like one my first year of life. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what did they say? Did That's they say? when they diagnosed me with a, a aortic valve defect, which meant my aortic valve was not pro pro functioning properly. Okay. And so at one year old, how does that, according to your parents, because you're one right. and you don't really remember, how does that affect you at one years old? Well, it's funny because at one, I thrived like a one-year-old. Um, what I find out now, what my parents said, is that I was a very fussy baby. Mm -hmm. I cried a lot. And, you know, people just think, well, she's crying a lot because she's spoiled, you know? Right. And right. I, I could have been a little bit spoiled because I was the baby, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Being held and all of that. <laughs> she was. She was. <laughs> she was. <laughs> I'm just saying. So, you know, they just say you, she may be spoiled, but we find out later that maybe those cries were coming because there actually was some discomfort. 
going on. A one year old or two year old, they can't tell you. Express it. Right. They cannot tell you. They right. don't they don't know. Right. So all they know is they don't feel well or something doesn't feel right. Right. So I just think about this. I think about I think at that time when I was diagnosed, I really think the burden was on my parents mm -hmm. because now they know that this their child has this problem. Right. And now what are we going to do? Now what's going to happen to her? Mm -hmm. So at one, you know, at one and two, from, from what I could recall, I don't recall anything different. Right. But I'm sure if you spoke to my parents, I'm sure they'll tell you, you know, maybe they were frightened, you know, maybe they, they leaned hard on their faith, you know, mm -hmm. they you just don't right. know their story, exactly. but... Even going around now doing this advocacy work, I find that I'm very connected to parents that have children yeah. with heart disease because you as a parent want to know what is going to be the trajectory of your child's life. Right, right. You right. don't you know don't that. Know. You don't know that. So when you see someone like me and you see that, you know, I've lived and I've lived well and i went to school and had a career and I'm doing all of these different things, you know, they're like, wow, thank you. They want, I would imagine that they gravitate towards you because back then, I, I would, when you were a child, I would imagine your parents getting this news, they're probably thinking, I don't know how long my child has Absolutely. to live. And that's frightening. Absolutely. Are you the only child? Absolutely not. There were five of us. Five of you. Are you the only child that had a heart? I am the only child that had a congenital heart disease. Two of my sisters, from what I understand, were born with heart murmurs. Okay. But they went away. Okay, they went away. Yeah. So now can... Well, we'll, we'll get into that. Take okay. me to the when Teresa became aware. Like, hey, uh, you know what? Something is... Wrong. I, I don't I hate to say wrong, but something is different. How old were you and what, what did you experience? Take me back to that day. Okay. Um, I, when I first realized that I had a problem probably was around kindergarten or first grade. Okay, what, that young? Yes, because now you're in grade school mm -hmm. and there were certain activities that maybe I couldn't participate in. And even at five years, you'd be surprised at the recollection mm -hmm from a five-year-old, and I just started remembering going back and forth to the doctor, back and forth to the doctor. So then you know you're seeing the cardiologist. So back then, you at five, you don't know a cardiologist, right. but you know they tell you he's a heart doctor. Right. Mm -hmm. So now I know I'm seeing a heart doctor, and I'm seeing this heart doctor between every six months and every year. So, you know, it's starting It's different to, from what your right, friends are doing. It's different than what your friends are doing. And you know that there's something going on, but you still don't really understand the, the importance and the dynamics mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So, when I, I will say I started to realize that I was different, mm -hmm. because I call it different. Um, and different is not bad. No, like, it's not different bad. is is we're all different. But I started to realize that I was different as I started maturing in um, fifth grade and fourth grade and sixth grade, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. where my friends maybe could take gym the whole year mm -hmm. and I had to sit out. Or did you, you have to sit out gym completely? Yes, I, I sat out gym. Um, I participated sometimes. Depending on what was going on medically, other times I couldn't take it. Did you want to take gym? Because I never wanted to take gym. You did. Yeah, well, when you when, when you're, you're deprived of something, you, yeah. and you know it looks it's the fun. world. Yeah. Yes, I never like changing into that uniform. I didn't want to put it on. I didn't want to be bothered. Uh, I did. I I wanted like I wanted to participate, and I don't know if it was that I wanted to participate in gym. Just I just what, wanted to do what my friends were, were doing. doing. So, and speaking of your friends, how did they react or respond to you not being able to do what they were doing? My friends, my good friends, they were okay because they kind of knew. Okay. So I'm figuring maybe their parents had a conversation with them 
Maybe my parents had a conversation with mm -hmm. them. But the truth is, people can have all the conversations they want. You're still going to feel different. Mm -hmm. You feel ostracized. And I remember it's a couple times that I would sit on, you know, the side and I would just watch and I would just say, wow. So what my school did, um, well, I had a nurse and I always had really good teachers mm -hmm. and, and I was very close to my school nurse who has since transitioned. But I worked in her office during my gym period and she would just give me little jobs mm -hmm. to do, you know, just to keep me busy and, and just to keep me yeah. encouraged and just to keep me occupied. And that has been the story of my life. Mm -hmm. I have always, always had great support systems mm -hmm. within my family, you know, and within school. Mm -hmm. So my school was well aware of my condition. And instead of trying to exclude me, they tried to include me. Awesome. Yes. Beautiful. And then also in high school, was it the same? High yeah. school, it, it was the same, yes. My, my school staff were awesome. Because then you're dating also in high school, right? Some of us were right. dating. Well, I, you know, I was the daughter <laughs> of a police officer. Oh. oh. But, you know, I, I, you're right. We were dating in high school. Moment of silence for all the... <laughs> Young men that admire you, and they knew. They, woo. Okay. Well, you know, you go through the ups and downs and the highs and lows of being a teenager, but I think those were my toughest years, and I'm going to tell you why. Mm -hmm. I had my first open heart surgery in the eighth grade. Eighth grade? How do you... How do you... I, I want to ask you, how do you mentally prepare for open heart surgery, or who... Who prepares you for that? Eighth grade. You, I remember oh, that wow. day. Every surgery I had, I remember the day like it was yesterday. But I remember going to the doctor. And I remember my doctor saying to me, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. Then he asked me to step outside. He spoke to my parents. Mm -hmm. Now, what I did know from growing up with this, you learn to read doctors' faces. You learn to read their reactions. Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't realize this, but you start to have some anxiety. Absolutely. Yeah, and you don't realize it at that time, but, you know, it's like, okay, well, when I go here, what am I going to hear? Better or worse? Because you know that's all you're going to hear right. because this never goes away. Right. So it's either going to be stable or it's even going to be worse. Mm -hmm. So this particular year, it was worse. Mm -hmm. And I got referred to uh, Mount Sinai in New York where I am there. I've been there since I was an adolescent. Okay. And um, my, my doctor, who I just lost him a few years ago, and it was so difficult he literally grew up right. with me. He knows your history. He literally grew up with me. And, and I, I have a great, great doctor now. He's stellar, too, mm -hmm. in the field. But my childhood doctor that accompanied me, um, when we had that conversation, mm -hmm. he said, kiddo, you know, we, we, have, we have to have surgery. And this is in eighth grade? This is in eighth grade. And I remember my parents' faces. And pardon me if I get a little choked up. I remember my parents' faces. And um, I said surgery. And a couple days later, we met with a consulting team. And mm -hmm. they told me what I would expect and what we could expect. And I think the most alarming for me was knowing that it could go either way. Mm -hmm. Did your parents prepare you for that? back then or is it something you just knew uh prepared me for it going either way yeah. prepare me for death the possibility of it my family and my parents are very spiritual mm -hmm. so god was always mm -hmm. an integral part of my life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my parents never prepared me for death we did not speak that mm -hmm. 
they spoke life into me Amen. and purpose. Amen. And they said, listen, you're going to be here. Ooh, that gives me goosebumps. It did. And God is going to cover you. And then I had my doctor who said, listen, she has the best surgeon. I'm going to be right in there with her. She's going to get through this. And I'm going to dance at her wedding. And he did. He was there at my wedding when I married my husband. But it was, it was difficult. So, mm -hmm. going through that, so now you're already going through puberty. Right. So you have all of these hormones. Mm -hmm. So even now on top of these hormones, now you have this illness, pain healing from surgery, psychological issues from the event itself, right. and knowing that you have this, and then now you have this reminder mm -hmm. that is there, mm -hmm. which you already felt different, but now you really feel different because it's right here where everybody could see. Mm -hmm. So it was a really, really, really tough time. Mm -hmm. You said uh, one of many surgeries. How many surgeries have you had over your lifetime? I've had two open heart surgeries. Um, my last surgery was not open, meaning they didn't cut my chest bone open for this last one, but I had a pulmonary valve replacement for the third one. And chances are there will be more. I just, you know, my mind is trying. I, I, you know, I'm in, in talk, speaking with you. I'm still, I'm in eighth grade with you. And coming out, how do you recover? What's, what's the recovery like? It was horrible. It's very painful. Mm -hmm. um, again, my parents were right there with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I'm, uh, every uh, or ah, or, oh my God. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom was right there. My dad was right there. And what happens is, because you don't feel well, mm -hmm. and because you are starting to realize that you're different, mm -hmm. Cause you know, you're going through puberty, everything is changing. Right. Your body is changing, your yes. looks are changing, everything is changing. So, like, literally, your self esteem plummets. Yes. Yes. It does. Yes. And I can remember, um, as I was healing and going through this and going into high school, I was very self conscious mm -hmm. about my scar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my mom, I'll never forget this because I was sort of having what I called a breakdown. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I hate this. I hate it. I want this off of me. I want this removed. And I got so upset. My mother and I, we were going shopping. And she said to me, listen, mm -hmm. that is your badge mm -hmm. of courage. You wear that proud. Because if it wasn't for that, we won't have you here. Mm -hmm. She said, and I don't care mm -hmm. what you go through. You are brilliant yes. and you are beautiful. Yes. Then I, you know, and then my dad told me, listen, you are my baby. You are God's child. Mm -hmm. You are beautiful and you are purpose. So, what you have mm -hmm. is when the world is telling you you don't measure up mm -hmm. or you don't look this way or you have this scar or you don't have this kind of shape or you don't have that. That's right. When the world tells tell you that, you. they will tell they you will that. remind you. Terrible. They will tell you that. But when you have that foundation mm -hmm. at home, there will be times that those voices outside will overpower, you know, what you've been taught or what you've heard. Mm -hmm. But remember that Bible verse, train Ooh, up a child. child the way that he should go. Exactly. The Lay the foundation yes. and everything else yes. will follow. And that has been 
the course of my life. So now, yes. before where I used to hide this, now I could barely cover it up because I won't. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Because you know what I heard you say is that, you know, mom was praying and I oh God, thank Dad, God for Dad praying too. mother. Dad and, too. and you said mom would pray life and purpose. And I look at this, you know, while you're speaking, I'm thinking of your scar and, and I look at it as a covenant between your mom and the Lord that mom was praying and believing God and God just said, you know what, I got her. I got her. I got her. and you are yet alive today and you are oh, yet walking in today. purpose. Absolutely. What mom spoke over your life, you were yet walking in. Thank you, God. I, I just get so full. And mm, I'm telling you, from you, a Lord. child, from a child, both, both, both of my parents spoke that. And I just, my dad is, um, my dad is a very strong, caring man. And... We loved his children when we were his babies, and mm -hmm. I was the baby. And, you know, fathers, they want to protect yes. Yes. their children. Yes. And you can't protect your child from an illness. And, you know, I remember, you know, my daddy would say to me, mm -hmm. you are supposed to be here. Yes. Purpose. You are my fighter. Yes. And even now, when, when I go through different things, you know, my mother will pray over me and my father will say, you are meant to survive. You're a right. You're a warrior. You're a warrior. Yes. And, it, and it's just, you know, those things are, are very, very, um, mm -hmm. and they're very inspiring and they have set the foundation mm -hmm. for who I am as a woman today. Before I went on that gurney uh, mm -hmm. for that first surgery at 12, mm -hmm. my mother prayed with me all night. We stayed at the hospital, prayed with me all night. And one of the prayers that I, I had to learn to recite was the 23rd Psalm. And my, mom, my mother said to me, whenever, I don't care what it is, whenever you feel afraid, mm -hmm. You recite this because God has you covered. Cover. Cover. Yes, and my, her, my dad and her, we went walking down there praying, and they went praying with me. Ooh. And my dad said he will never forget I was leaving. You know, they were pushing me in. This is where I'm really, really going to get torn up. They were pushing me in, and both parents were grabbing my arms. And my dad said I looked up at him. And I said, don't worry, Dad. I'll be okay. And, you know, they let go. Mm -hmm. And even at that young age, I just had this spirit of peace mm -hmm. cover me. Mm -hmm. And in this day right now, when things get a little too much, or when I get discouraged, I know how to go and seek that place of peace. Wow. That's beautiful. Yes. Now, I, I always like to... Ooh. I know. I always like to get the story outside of the story. And so before we wrap up, you're walking in purpose. You are now an advocate. So tell us what it is that you do and what it is that you are... Just, you're sharing a message. You're, you're literally yelling out there, not verbally, right. but just your presence. What are right. you doing now? So many things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a passion for health. I have a passion for women's rights. Yes. I have a passion mm -hmm. for children. Mm -hmm. And I have a passion to inspire people to reach their full potential. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that everybody has a purpose. Yes. So what am I doing now? I am I'm a heart advocate where I talk to people about taking care of their hearts. 80%, mm -hmm. according to the American Heart Association, 80% of cardiac events could be avoided just by lifestyle wow. changes. Lifestyle changes as in what? What we eat, exercise? Eat, 
exercise, proper medical care. And although I'm not a medical professional, I am someone who had lived with this disease my entire life. And I've been blessed to still be here. Yes. So it's my calling to take this message and to take this word and to spread it. Because we don't have to die. Heart disease affects one in three women. They said one in three women will die or suffer a heart or stroke emergency. And we don't, it's, it affects all of all us, us. many and women. It does. This is not to exclude anyone. Right. This is right. not to exclude anyone because it affects all of us. But we tend to focus sometimes on women because why we often don't focus on, on ourselves. ourselves. Everybody else. We everybody, everybody else. else. So my point is and, and, and my plea is yeah, please speak to them. know the warning signs of heart and stroke emergencies. Know for yourself. Teach your children. Learn CPR. You know, work with your doctors. Please go get your medical follow-ups. Yes. Know your numbers, cholesterol, you know, um, insulin, uh, glucose numbers. Please just know all of your numbers yes. that you can live a longer mm -hmm. and healthier life. Mm -hmm. That is my hope and my prayer. That's one of the reasons why I advocate yes. so hard for heart disease. Um, in 2014, I was also diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. That we never saw coming. Mm -hmm. That was just Who difficult. would see that coming? I never now, do you, because we, we have about a minute, okay. a minute and a half left. Do you say, you know, like, God, I, ca I had this heart disease all my life. God, now this? Like, what? What? How does that? What do you Absolutely. I, I say that. I ask that. I have those moments. But then, like I tell you, I go to that space. Or my husband will say to me, who's been a great support, I love him to death. Yes, he, he's awesome. I'll go to that place and, and my family will tell me, you can do this. And so instead of why me, mm -hmm. I say, okay, God, you know what? You chose me. Mm -hmm. So now tell me what it is you want for me to do. Right. What am I going to do? Because this is what's true. Everything that has occurred in my life mm -hmm. is just a testament to the glory of God. Amen. She learned that illness is a physical state and sometimes she has no control. She learned that God is the healer of all. He gave her a story to be told. Want to find out more about I Ain't That Chick? Visit our website at www.iainthatchick.com.